So uh, the second paper of today is uh, Blockhammer. Uh, so this is the newest paper published in Rohammer Mitigation Research. And uh, so it was published uh, just a few weeks ago. And hopefully uh, you will be exposed to the cutting edge in this area now. Uh, so our presenter for this paper is Sophie. Uh, and uh, she's a second year bachelor student in the Department of Computer Science. And yeah, so please welcome Sophie for her presentation and uh, discussion about the future works in this area. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. My name is Sophie and I will be presenting to you the paper Blockhammer Preventing Rohammer at Low Cost by Blacklisting Rapidly Access DRAM Rows. So let me begin with a short executive summary of what we will be seeing today. So due to memory density scaling, current and also future DRAM chips are more vulnerable to Rohammer. But unfortunately, the present solutions can scale accordingly. And in addition, they also often require knowledge of or modification to the DRAM internals. So that leads us to the goal of this paper, which is to find a scalable and efficient alternative to prevent Rohammer without knowing anything about the DRAM internals or changing anything about it. And the key idea to do this is to selectively throttle memory accesses uh, that can cause bit flips. So the Rohammer like memory accesses. And we do this by tracking the row activation rate of all the rows. And with that data, we throttle accesses to rows that were activated too frequently within a specific time window. We also try to mitigate the Rohammer attack at the thread level to minimize the performance degradation incurred on benign applications. And then in the results, we will see that the proposed solution is very scalable. Uh, both in terms of hardware complexity, but also in terms of performance and energy consumption. In addition, in the presence of a Rohammer attack, it has a significantly better performance and also lower energy consumption than all of the other me mitigation mechanisms. So let's take a look at what we will be discussing today. Uh, so the structure of this presentation is very similar to the executive summary, uh, only that in the end, we will also add a discussion of some of the strengths and the weaknesses of this paper and also some interesting future developments about Blockhammer and uh, Rohammer solutions in general. Okay, so let's see what Rohammer is all about and why it is necessary to find a good solution. Um, and to do so, we will start off with a short recap on the structure of DRAM banks and cells. So as you might already know, a DRAM cell encodes exactly one single bit of data. And this can be either zero or one, and that, that depends on the amount of charge in the capacitor. Now, unfortunately, DRAM cells, and then more specifically the capacitor, they leak charge over time. And that means that they need to be refreshed periodically or we would lose important data. And now if we combine uh, DRAM cells then like into rows and columns and two-dimensional structure, we get a DRAM bank. Um, and then to open or activate a DRAM row, we need to apply a high enough voltage level to that row's word line. Uh, and this then copies the row to the row buffer. And that's where we keep it until all of the subsequent uh, requests from the memory controller for that specific row have been finished. Um, and after that's done, we close the row. Uh, and that's also something that we call pre-charging. And this pre-charging state is pretty much the general state of all the other non-active rows. OK, so the thing is, over the years, the size of a DRAM cell and also its cell-to-cell -cell spacing have decreased quite a lot. And that means that DRAM chips of today can store more data on the same surface area than DRAM chips from 10 years ago, for example. But this also means that the cells are now too close to each other and close enough so that they can electrically interfere with each other. So um, when we activate a specific row, the adjacent rows will also get activated a little bit. And this means that some of the more vulnerable cells in that row can lose a bit of their charge. And of course, if we keep opening and closing the same row over and over again, this might cause a cell to eventually lose too much charge before we can restore it with a refresh. And that is when a bit flip can happen. Now let's see how this phenomenon works in more detail. And also, by the way, this is called Rohammer. So uh, here you can see a DRM bank, and it will be the red row that we will be opening and closing a couple of times. Uh, we call this row the aggressor row. Uh, and then the rows that will be affected by the Rohammer attack are called the victim rows. OK, so let's try to imitate a Rohammer attack. So if we open and close a row often enough, we see something strange happening. So we see the colors of the bits gradually changing, and this basically represents the loss of charge. And then once the bits are colored bright yellow, then we have a bit flip. So I hope that was kind of clear as to how that worked, and I hope that makes sense. 
Um, now, obviously, whenever there is a problem, we want to find a solution, right? Especially for a problem as severe as Wilhammer. And over the last few years, many researchers did in fact come up with some pretty innovative ideas to that. So let's discuss some of the general concepts and ideas behind them and see how everything works. Okay, so first let's take a look at uh, increasing the refresh rate of all the DRAM rows. Uh, so increasing the refresh rate of a row can reduce the probability of row harm inducing a bit flip, but it doesn't really stop it because it only works up till a certain point. So we know that cell size and also cell to cell spacing are decreasing. And that means that the required number of row activations we need to induce bit flips also decreases. And this then means that we have to increase the refresh rate accordingly. But unfortunately, refreshing rows takes quite some time, and it also can be done in, in parallel with handling the memory requests. So this would reduce the time we can use to transfer data even more, which is obviously very bad, right? Uh, so to visualize this concept, let's you just show you some animations. Um, so again, here we see the aggressor row that was already activated a couple of times. And we also see that some DRM cells have lost a bit of their charge, but not enough yet to cause a bit flip, because remember that was bright yellow. And then before we can activate the aggressor row even more, we will refresh all the DRAM rows. And then after the refresh, everything is restored like it was before. Okay, so as you can see, increasing the refresh rate is not really a scalable solution, but it does lead to another idea, which we will call reactive refresh. And the concept of reactive refresh is to only refresh the victim rows. And obviously this is more efficient, right? But unexpectedly, the problem here is that identifying the rows adjacent to an aggressor row, so the victim rows, that's pretty difficult. And to explain you why, we need to go all the way back to when a DRM chip is being manufactured. So during manufacturing, some of the DRM cells and also rows and columns don't work properly. Manufacturers always leave some spare rows and columns, just in case, since this happens in every DRM chip. And then later in a test phase, DRM addresses are then being remapped. And that causes two rows that are numerically adjacent, so two rows whose indexes uh, only differ by one within a DRAM bank, to not necessarily be physically adjacent anymore. And then on top of that, most manufacturers also remap DRAM addresses to minimize the losses from differences in access latency. And they keep this remapping undisclosed because it would give insight into manufacturing yield and chip design. So all of that makes it even more difficult for us to find our victim rows. Now to touch on the latter topic, um, recently a paper was published where researchers were able to reverse engineer the DRAM mappings in under eight minutes on average. Um, I'll leave out the details, but if you're interested, you can look it up. Um, but basically, well, this method was called DRAM deck. And this basically means that in the future, it might actually become very easy to find our victim rows. Great, right? Um, and then a second weakness of reactive refresh is that, well, not for all of the methods, but some of the methods are probabilistic of nature, and that means that they can't prevent Rohammer completely. So there's still a low probability of Rohammer inducing a bit flip there. Okay, now to visually recap this really quickly, here's how reactive refresh works. Okay, so contrary to increasing the refresh rate of all the rows, we see that here only the new by rows are refreshed, and that's pretty much just the key feature here. Okay, so we've seen some solutions that are related to the refresh rate. Now let's talk about another and this time more physical approach to mitigating Rohammer. And that is the concept of physical isolation. So we want to physically separate sensitive data and we can do that by, for example, adding a buffer row um, in between every row or by modifying the memory allocator of the user and to separate the rows of the user and the kernel mode. Now, some of you might probably think, like, how can this possibly be an efficient way to solve Rohammer? Like, doesn't it just go completely against the idea of memory density scaling? Um, well, it kind of, and it kind of doesn't. Um, but like, we know that Rohammer is getting worse because memory is getting denser. And that means that we have to provide greater isolation around the aggressor rows. But that obviously wastes memory capacity and also reduces the fraction of cells that we can protect from Rohammer. And then also in addition, another weakness is that just like before we encountered the problem of finding our victim rows efficiently. So this approach has quite a lot of weaknesses, right? But those aren't even the main reasons as to why these, why these solutions aren't really used because the main reason is that researchers have actually already found other ways to induce bit flips in these systems. So they're not row homer safe anymore. Okay, so here is like an example of how this could look in memory with the buffer rows. Um, 
And then as row harm is getting worse, we would need to add even more buffer rows eventually. Okay, so after all of that, we finally arrived at the very last and also the most relevant category for today, and that is proactive throttling. So proactive throttling basically limits repeated accesses to the same row, uh, and it can do that by, for example, setting a minimum row access delay, uh, so by letting some time pass before allowing another row activation, um, or another way is to just count the number of row accesses over a specific period of time, and then delay the next row activations uh, when the activation counts count exceeds some predetermined uh, number. But obviously this leaves us with some implementation challenges, right? Like will we delay every single memory access, or only some of them? And will we track the row activation count of all the rows or only a couple? And if so, which ones? And so this is like kind of a conceptual overview of how it could look to set a minimum delay between row activations. Um, so when we want to get access to a specific row, we first need to check if the countdown timer has reached zero. And if it hasn't yet, we can access the row, but if it has, we can. And then after we get access, we would have to reset the timer again. Okay, so as you can see, as of this moment, there are already quite a lot of solutions out there, uh, but we're looking for a better solution. And we want to find an efficient and also a scalable solution to Rohammer that can be implemented easily without any knowledge of or modification to the DRAM internals. And the key idea to do this is to selectively throttle Rohammer memory accesses. And we do it like this. So first, we want to track the activation rates of all the DRAM rows, and we want to do that in an area-efficient way. And then we use that data later to throttle the Rohammer unsafe row activations. And then lastly, we also want to identify the threats that a Rohammer attack can originate from. And then once we find a suspect, we limit its ability to issue new memory requests. And that then in return frees up memory bandwidth for the benign threats. So we've seen the problem that Rohammer poses and also some of the weaknesses of the current solutions. So let's talk about Blockhammer now and see how it works. So Blockhammer is made up of two separate components. One is called Roblocker and the other one is called Attack Traveler. Uh, let's just start with Roblocker for now. So as you can see in this uh, sort of schematic overview, Roblocker itself also consists of two separate components. Uh, and we will be starting with the orange one here and that's Roblocker uh, Blacklist. Um, so before we go into the details of the exact implementation, let's just first look at Roblocker's blacklisting goals first. Um, so remember we want to use Roblocker to prevent that rows can be activated frequently enough to incur a bed flip. And to do so, we need to track how many times a row has been activated. And then blacklist the row when its activation rate exceeds the blacklisting threshold. Uh, as for the blacklisting threshold, this is a threshold that we want to set lower than the point where Rohammer bed flips can occur. But obviously these goals kind of bring up the question, like how do we do this efficiently without having a large area overhead? And the answer is actually pretty simple. We just use a special kind of bloom filter and that is the dual counting bloom filter. So let's start from the basics and see how we can build up the dual counting bloom filter starting from a normal one. Uh, so to recap, the goal of the bloom filter is to check uh, if a certain element is in the set and to do that in an area efficient way. Because obviously we don't want like a table entry for each element, right? And that is why we use hash functions to map each element to a set number of array indexes. Okay, so I'll now show you a couple of examples so that you can see how a Bloom filter works. Uh, so let's insert five into the set. Uh, so five will be hashed to a set of array indexes. Uh, that's here like one, four, and 10. And then after that, we will set the bits of the respective bit array entries to one, uh, if they weren't already. Okay, so five is now in our set. And then if we go through the same steps again for seven, nothing really new happens except that we maybe like see the hash indexes of five and seven overlap at H1. Okay. And then for nine, like nothing really special happens anymore. Okay, so like obviously you can just keep inserting elements here, but that's not really the point. Uh, so instead, let's just test whether a number is in the set. Um, so here that's nine. So evidently we know that nine is in the set because we can read it from the slide. But how does a Bloom filter find out? So like before, nine is hashed to indexes two, six, and nine. And the Bloom filter now reads the respective entries in the bit array and then checks if all of them are set to one. And here the Bloom filter correctly identified that nine is in the set. But I'll now show you an example that doesn't work. And it doesn't work because we allow the overlap of some hash indexes. So remember with five and seven, the hash indexes overlapped at H1. 
Um, so to show you this, let's test if eight is in the set. Um, well, we expect the answer no, right? But strangely enough, the Bloom filter returns true. And this is called a false positive. This usually occurs as Bloom filters start to get more filled up. So when they get saturated, um, but don't worry too much about that for now. We'll address this problem later. Okay, so remember that we want to count how many times the row has been activated. And we can do this by using a kind of variation on the Bloom filter, and that is the counting Bloom filter. Uh, now, the difference with the normal version is just that it tracks the exact number of times an element is inserted into the set. Uh, so it'll allow the array entries to hold bigger numbers instead of just one bit. So if we go through the same examples again as before, uh, we just see some small differences. Like for example, here we see a two in the array. Um, and then we can also see another difference when we test if an element is in the set. So instead of just testing if all the entries are equal to one, we test if the minimum of the entry values is bigger than the threshold. Uh, but now back to something that I mentioned before. So as more and more elements are added to the set, Bloom filters eventually get saturated and then they will start to return true all the time. So we need to find a solution for that. Uh, so, so let's see if we can get away with just deleting an element that the Bloom filter thinks is in the set. Uh, and to spare you some time, I'll just immediately give you an example that shows you why this doesn't work. Um, so if we choose to delete eight, we first reduce its respective entry values by one. But like, as you can see, this clearly allows something that shouldn't happen, right? Because first of all, we just delete an element that was not in the set. But the problem really shows when we test for five. So the Bloom filter says that five is not in the set, but we can clearly see that it is, right? Um, so testing for an element that is actually in the set, but getting the result that it's not, uh, that is called a false negative, and that's something that we obviously want to prevent. But <laughs> unfortunately, we can't prevent it all the time. But we can ensure that all the elements that we inserted recently can still be found in the array. And this is where the unified Bloom filter comes in. So a unified Bloom filter basically tracks all elements that were inserted into the filter during a specific time window. Okay, so um, here's how a unified Bloom filter works. So instead of one Bloom filter, we now have two, one that takes on an active role and the other one that takes on a passive role. Um, so note that both of the filters always insert all of the elements that are added into the set, but only the active filter will respond to the test queries. And something else that is typical of a unified Bloom filter is that the active filter clears out its bit array after some time has passed. And then after that, it switches roles with the passive filter. So the active filter becomes the passive filter and the passive filter becomes the active filter. Um, so using a unified Bloom filter pretty much ensures that any element that was inserted in the previous or the current epoch, um, that it will be able to be found by the Bloom filter. So this means that there will be no false negatives if we test for elements that were inserted recently. So as you can see, um, the unified Bloom filter looks pretty similar to the previous examples, only that we now have two beta rays. Um, so note that in this example, we will use the same hash functions for both filters. But in reality, you can just use different ones for each, and you can also change them every epoch. Okay, so in the beginning, we don't really see a difference. Like it's pretty much the same as like a normal Bloom filter. But then once we've reached the end of the first epoch, we clearly, clearly notice something, right? Um, so we can see that the entire active filter was cleared out here. And then after that, we just continue. But now we see that filter A has become the passive filter, and filter B is now the active filter. So their roles are switched. And then if we test for numbers now, uh, you can see that only the active filter, which is filter B here, will respond to the test query. Okay, so I hope this kind of figures up how a unified Bloom filter works, because this can be kind of abstract. Okay, so um, now to track which rows have been activated, we can use a unified Bloom filter, like we saw before. And then to track how many times they were activated, we combine the unified Bloom filter with the counting Bloom filter. And that is what creates the dual counting Bloom filter. Uh, and this is pretty much how it looks schematically. Uh, so whenever a row address's activation rate is above the blacklisting threshold, the dual counting Bloom filter will return that the row is blacklisted. So we've seen a pretty detailed overview of row buffer VL, right? Uh, so let's move on to the row buffer history buffer. And our two main goals here are that we want to know which rows were activated recently and if the row that is currently on the verge of being activated is one of them. And we do that by uh, storing a record of the recently activated rows in a first in first out queue. So each entry of the queue stores information about first of all the row IDs, 
uh, which we make unique within DRAM rank. And it also stores the timestamp at which the row was last activated. Uh, and then we also have a power bit. Uh, so whenever we insert a new entry, we store all of that information in the queue. We also update the tail pointer. And then we can also test if an element is in the queue by comparing the row addresses with the row IDs. Uh, but then the most interesting part actually happens when we update the queue. And this happens automatically every cycle. Um, so each cycle, we look at the timestamp of the oldest entry. Uh, and then we check if the difference with the current time is bigger than t delay. And if the difference is bigger, we invalidate the entry and update the head pointer. Um, so for the record, t delay is like the minimum time delay that we want to have between two consecutive row activations. OK, and um, that was pretty much all for RoboWalker history buff, actually. Uh, so now let's see how the both of them work together. Uh, so RoboWalker essentially checks if row activation is row homer safe. Um, and it does it like this. So um, whenever a memory request scheduler receives the row activation request, RoboWalker will then first check if that row address has been blacklisted by RoboWalker VL and if it is being stored in the history buffer. So if the row is blacklisted, so if it was activated frequently, and if it was also activated recently, uh, so we, that means that we also found it in the history buffer, then we let the memory request scheduler know that the row activation is not row hammer safe. And during the scheduler blocks the row activation. And then once the row becomes safe again, so after t delayed time has passed, the scheduler issues a row activation and inserts the row into both the history buffer and also into the boom filters. And that was it for build blocker. Uh, so let's move on to the second big component of block hammer, and that is the tech throttler. Uh, so attack throttler also has two main goals. We want to find the threats that are likely to cause row hammer attacks, and then we want to limit their memory bandwidth usage. So to correctly identify the attacker threats, the paper introduced the Rohama likelihood index, and that basically estimates how likely it is for a threat to induce a bit split. And to calculate it, we simply count the number of times each threat uh, performs a row activation to a blacklisted row, uh, and we do that in each bank. And then we can normalize this over the maximum number of times a blacklisted row can be activated in a blockhammer protected system. So for a benign threat, the RHLI should be zero, or at least close to zero, um, because row activation count should not exceed the blacklisting thresholds. But as a threat's RHLI reaches one, it's only more and more likely to induce row hammer bit slips. And that will require us to take action. So in short, the Rohammer Liquid Index basically quantifies how similar a threat's memory access pattern is to a real Rohammer attack. Now, how do we calculate the Rohammer Liquid Index on a hardware level? Um, and the answer is actually pretty simple. We just use two counters per thread and per DRAM bank. Uh, and we use the same time interleaving mechanism of uh, the dual counting boom filter that we saw before. So again, similar to before, we have an active and then a passive counter. Uh, and we let both counters increment when a thread activates a blacklisted row. And then again, we only use the active counter to calculate the Rohamid likelihood index. Uh, in the end, uh, whenever RoboCker clears its active filter in a bank, Attack Rattler also clears its, all of its active counters in that same bank. And then it switches rules. So the active one becomes passive one, passive one becomes active one. OK, and that's pretty much how we calculate the Rohamid likelihood index for thread. So now that we can identify the attacker threats, we want to limit our memory bandwidth usage. And we do this by applying a quota to the threat's total in-flight memory requests. So this quota is set inversely proportional to the row hammer likelihood index. And this means that whenever a threat keeps blacklisting a row, the row hammer likelihood index will increase, and then the quota of the threat will decrease. And then once a threat reaches its quota, it cannot make any new memory requests anymore until an ongoing request is completed. And doing this essentially allows us to lessen the memory bandwidth usage of malicious threads, and in turn frees up the memory bandwidth for benign threads, so that they don't have to suffer from a row hammer attack. So uh, we've seen how we can identify attacker threads and also limit their memory usage. But maybe there is something else that we can do with the RHLI. And this is like a third goal that was shortly introduced in the paper, but wasn't really mentioned in detail. Um, but the main idea is that we want to share the RHLI with the operating system so that the operating system can then mitigate the Rohama attack at the software level, for example, by killing or descheduling the attacker threads. And that was all for attack crawler, and that also brings us to the next part of the presentation, and that is the results. Uh, so remember that our goal is to see 
a block hammer is a scalable and also efficient solution to the Wilhammer problem. Um, and to see if that's actually the case, we compare block hammer with a baseline system and then six other well-known solutions to Wilhammer. So we have three probabilistic ones and three deterministic ones. Uh, so remember that the probabilistic solutions still leave a low probability of inducing a bed flip, um, but this is not an issue for deterministic mechanisms. But the deterministic ones do generally have a bigger area overhead. Okay, so we will analyze block hammer in two different ways. We will first look at the hardware complexity, and we will also look at the performance and energy consumption. Uh, so let's first look at the hardware cost of block hammer. So there are several aspects that we need to take into account here. We have area costs, uh, excess energy, and then static power consumption. Uh, but for this part of the presentation, I'll only go over the specifics of area in millimeter squared because the conclusion is the same for them uh, anyways. So, um, but if you're interested in the details, you can read it either in the backup slides or in the paper. Um, also, the uh, PowerPoint is already on the website under the uh, sessions uh, section. Um, okay, so if we look at the area costs, we see that para, proid, and the Marilock are extremely area efficient compared to the other solutions. And this is because they are probabilistic mechanisms, so they don't need to store metadata to track row activation rates. And the deterministic, the deterministic solutions and block hammer do fall behind quite a bit. Um, and we can also see that it is graphene that uh, takes the first place here, with a pretty right margin, actually. But block hammer and twice are still relatively good runners. Things do change when we get to a Rohammer threshold of 1,000. Um, so we know that Rohammer is getting worse due to memory density scaling, right? And as Rohammer is worsening, we need to be able to scale our solutions accordingly. But that seems to be a problem for most of the current mechanisms, as you can see in these results. Block hammer, however, is an exception, though. And it cl clearly scales much better than the other deterministic solutions. And it even almost catches up to graphene in terms of area costs. And as I said before, the same trends can be seen for both static power consumption and also excess energy, although in the latter, Blockhammer even takes up first place. Okay, so from the analysis, we can pretty much say that Blockhammer is a way more scalable solution than the other mitigation mechanisms. But in terms of hardware complexity, graphene is actually better than Blockhammer, at least for now. Because as Blockhammer will be getting worse in future DRAM chips, and since graphene doesn't scale as well, Blockhammer might eventually catch up. And that was it for the hardware complexity analysis. Now let's move on to the performance and energy consumption and see how that goes. Uh, so first we will be looking at the performance of a single benign thread. Uh, and we see that the probabilistic approaches clearly have some performance and, er and energy overheads. Uh, but if we look at the deterministic ones, we can't really see a difference with the baseline. And this is because we are only looking at the benign threads, uh, which never really activate rows at a high enough rate to require a victim row refresh. So if we then take a look at block hammer, we see that it also does not have any visible overhead. And that's because of similar reason, since no row with a low activation rate will be block posted. And also the RTLA of the benign threads will always be close to zero. Now let's take a look at a system with eight threads. Uh, so for now, we look at eight benign threads. And as you can see, the results are pretty much the same as when we had only one thread. Uh, the probabilistic solutions are not really doing that well, but the others are pretty much equal to the baseline. And then when we change one thread to perform a row hammer attack while still keeping the other seven doing normal stuff, we see something surprising. Like we see that block hammer now has a much higher performance and also lower DRAM energy consumption than the other mitigation mechanisms. Um, and then lastly, if we look at block hammer performance and energy consumption in terms of scalability, uh, we will also get some pretty cool results. So if you look at a system without and any ongoing row hammer attacks, we see that just like twice in graphene, uh, as Rohammer is getting worse, Blockhammer has a relatively constant and negligible performance and energy overhead, uh, but Para, on the other hand, doesn't really seem to be doing great, though. But then once in the presence of a Rohammer attack, we see that Blockhammer by far outperforms the other solutions, both in terms of performance and also in energy consumption. And this holds even for lower Rohammer thresholds. So we can really see here that Blockhammer is very scalable. Uh, so to quickly summarize, when there is no attack, block hammer is competitive with the other mitigation mechanisms in terms of performance and energy consumption, but when the Rohammer attack happens, it outperforms every single one of them. And that was all. Uh, so since we've talked about a lot of different concepts, let's end the presentation with a short summary of all that we've seen so far before we move on to the discussion. So first of all, we saw that due to memory density scaling, current and also future DRAM chips are more vulnerable to Rohammer. 
And unfortunately, the present solutions can't keep up with this trend. In addition, we also saw that especially the solutions uh, that fall into the group of reactive refresh and also physical isolation, they often need to know how DRM addresses are mapped. But this is usually kept a secret by the manufacturer. And that led us to the goal of the paper, which was to find a scalable and also efficient way to prevent real hammer without knowing anything about the DRM internals or changing anything about it. The others were able to do so with block hammer. Uh, so re remember that block hammer uh, consisted of two key mechanisms. So on the one hand, we have row blocker, uh, which tracks the work division rates in an area efficient way. And then in addition to that, it throttled all of the row accesses that were deemed row hammer unsafe. And then tech traveler, on the other hand, focuses more on the level of threats. Um, so we can minimize the performance degradation incurred by benign uh, on benign applications by identifying potential attacker threats. I do that by using the raw hammer likelihood index. And then after we have identified the malicious threats, we then limit their performance with a quota. Uh, and that quota was set inversely proportional to the RHLI. And then lastly, in the results, we saw that in terms of hardware complexity, block hammer is extremely scalable although it does not have the lowest hardware costs. We saw that graphene was more efficient, not as scalable. And as for performance and energy consumption, when there was no raw hammer attack, we saw that block hammer is competitive with other mitigation mechanisms, but in the presence of a raw hammer attack, block hammer proved to have a significantly better performance and also significantly less zero energy consumption. And that in comparison to all of the other popular mitigation mechanisms, and it worked even at lower raw hammer thresholds. So we can definitely conclude that Blockhammer is, first of all, a very innovative idea, but also an efficient and scalable solution to Rohammer. Okay, so that was all the theory for now. I guess that was quite a lot. Um, but let's move on to discussing the strengths and weaknesses of the paper. So one thing that Blockhammer discusses in its paper is its scalability as DRM chips are getting more vulnerable to Rohammer. And that is something that hasn't really been discussed before in any other paper, at least the paper that proposes solutions. And this makes the paper really stand out, but also Blockhammer itself, because it clearly is the most scalable solution so far. And then in addition, uh, I haven't really mentioned this specifically, but Blockhammer can be implemented completely in the memory controller. And it doesn't require any extra knowledge of or modifications to the DRM journals, contrary to many of the other solutions. And then thirdly, by distinguishing benign threats from malicious threats, Blockhammer can even improve performance during an ongoing Rohammer attack. And this is something that isn't seen at all in other solutions. And then in addition, uh, Blockhammer also introduces many new concepts, like for example, the dual counting room filter, uh, as well as plenty of other ideas for future research topics, uh, like for example, how we can use the Rohammer likelihood index at the software level. And then lastly, Blockhammer discusses a relatively new type of Rohammer mitigation, corrective throttling, uh, and this hasn't really been discussed in depth before, or at least has not produced any efficient, efficient solutions yet. Now, of course, Blockhammer does have some weaknesses, um, and one of them is that Blockhammer can be implemented in currently in use processor chips. Although I should probably note that this also holds for many other relevant solutions, uh, except for, for example, increasing the refresh rate of all the DRM nodes. And then second, some of the parameters in the paper, uh, uh, some of the parameters in the paper are determined empirically. Um, the counting boom filter size was one of them, and it's actually a parameter that influences the false positive rate of the boom filters. So the fact that it has only been determined by observation, but definitely leaves some room for improvement. And then lastly, the uh, evaluation is only simulated on a DDR4-based memory subsystem, uh, but this kind of leaves us with the question, like what about LP, DDR4, DDR3? Are there any big differences? Um, but I mean, we do expect the results to be pretty similar. Um, and hardware designers will redo the simulation anyway when they are designing their own memory systems. Uh, but it's still something to take note of, right? 